So I think Richard, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. I have, um, I think you should be able to share your screen if you'd like to do that, or I can just share the slides you shared with me. And Great, yeah, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to share real fast. Okay. Let me see. Are they visible? Uh, not quite yet. There they are. Yep. Awesome. Great. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm happy to just talk for a couple of minutes. I um. Yeah. I first first off, thank you all for having me today. Really really appreciate um, uh, the, the the chance to talk. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really excited about um, what you all are doing in this class. And so um, I just want to share a little bit about um, USA Facts. I, my, my name is Richard Coffin. I am, I am our uh, chief product officer, and I've been at this organization for about seven years since the, the founding of the organization. Um, and uh, for just a little bit of the, the backstory of, of who we are and, and, and why we're here. Um, I, we, we started in 2015 when, when Steve uh, Ballmer left Microsoft. And uh, he was trying to figure out, you know, how to start working on his philanthropy with with his wife Connie, and started thinking, hey, I could just um, pay my taxes. You know, the, the government does everything that I uh, want to do, and if we just paid our taxes, um, the government would take care of it. And um, you know, his, his wife said, hey, no, that's actually uh, let, let's let's try to Connie said let's try to challenge that. Let's see if we can do something different and fill in the blanks. And so he went out and looked for what would be the 10K for government, the annual report, the, um, the, you know, the thing that would tell him where does federal, state, and local money come from, where does it go, and uh, what are the outcomes that people get from it. And, and he realized that after, um, you know, after a few months of looking, that something like that didn't really exist. I mean, there were versions for different states, versions of the federal government, but there really wasn't a place to go see government spending, where it comes from, and, and where it goes, and what people get for it. And so he decided to, to create it. And that, that was, that was our, our origin. So um, we, start, we took the framework of, of that 10K, the SEC Form 10K that public companies have to file that you know, he, as CEO of Microsoft, was really familiar with. Um, you know, he has had to sign on the dotted line every year and say, this was the state of my company. And if, if I'm wrong, I will go to jail. He was like, you know, what, why, why is there something like that for the government? And so we said it's a great one. And, and so to do so, we, we organized um, all federal, state, and local spending into one view. Um, organized it into different business segments, we called it, um, which was the, uh, we organized them along the preamble to the constitution, um, various things like established justice and ensured domestic tranquility had things like crime and defense and things like that, um, or crime and disaster and things like that. And so, uh, and then we went out and looked at all federal agencies and said, hey, what, what money can, or what outcomes can we look at that can help people illuminate where government money goes, right? I mean, if you want to say, hey, are we, if anyone wants to say, are we spending the right amount of money in education, you might want to look at things like graduation rates and student teacher ratios and things like that. And so um, we set out to create a canon of data that could help people um, inform their decisions. Um, fast forward a couple years later to 2017, um, the whole concept of fake news had really become an issue. Things had changed quite a bit between 2015 and 2017, um, and misinformation was was something that people was on the top of people's minds. And so we decided to release this as a, a website and a web portal for the public. Um, so we launched on Tax Day 2017, and and since we've grown to an organization of about uh, 40 plus people, um, we have uh, collected data from over 100 organizations. Um, spent a lot of time um, basically trying to make it easy for people to uh, visualize data, understand data, and really understand what government does. Um, either things that people you know care about in general, like um, the budget and taxes and stuff like that, or things that are going on in the news, like um, certainly COVID has been uh, at the forefront of our um, focus for the past couple of years. Um, and so uh, who we are today, we, we are a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan civic initiative that uh, provides the most comprehensive and understandable government data out there. Um, we, we have basically committed to only using government data. We take it and we visualize it. We just want to basically be that presentation layer on top of um, the billions of dollars that are already spent um, on, on, on government data itself. Um, we just want to take that extra step um, and put that investment there. Um, we, we really focus on remaining true to our, our, our values, which um, we took from that whole concept of a 10K, things that the people um, you know, would be able to trust. So um, we, we say we are only factual, we only use government data, we really don't uh, stray from that uh, at all. Um, we, you know, people, people tend to trust um, that, that data um, and the investment in it, it certainly is one of the most invested in data sets in the, in the, in the world. Um, we are unbiased. We really try to remove as much bias as possible. Certainly, as you all know well, there are challenges within visualization and, and you know, subject collection, topic choice, and stuff like that that um, will make it, uh, you know, is, always has bias in it. But we, we try to do our best to remain unbiased and, and, and check with people on the right and the left and um, on all sides to see if, if we're remaining true to our vision. Um, we really do try to show federal, state, and local uh, data in one uh, place so you can get the full view, not just a single government's view as, as we're used to. 
uh, context is really important. Uh, we try to show historical trends and show data uh, within context, not siloed like it currently is across governments. Um, and then comprehensible, and that, that's that's something that certainly um, you know we rely heavily on data visualization to do that. And so um, that's certainly of interest to every, everyone here. Um, just a couple things I just want to share. I, I, one reason why we do this, I mentioned misinformation. Um, this is from a poll that we did a couple years ago called the State of the Facts poll. Um, the, the spread of misinformation uh, is something that all Americans are concerned about. 83% of Americans say it's a major problem today. And um, you know it's hard to get 83% of Americans to agree on anything. Um, so this is pretty staggering in our minds, but it's, it's, it's part of the reason we exist is you know, we feel like we can really uh, bring data together in a, a way that makes it easy for people to access. Um, it can help people believe in, in facts and, and hopefully um, believe in what the government does. Um, and just a couple examples of things we do on our site. I mean, I think one, um, one key visualization we have, um, this is uh, our Sankey diagram that shows uh, federal, or federal, state, and local spending in revenue combined into one view. Um, this isn't a view that you often will see. Um, you know, the government certainly talk, the federal government talks about this for themselves often, but doesn't include state and local um, uh, money. And so we wanted to create this, this full view. Um, this is something a couple of years ago, we presented this um, in one of our annual reports and we had some, uh, 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 there were a group of chiefs of staff of various senators. Um, and uh, we heard one of them whisper over the phone, take a picture of this because they hadn't seen a view like this presented of government spending. We, we sent them the deck, they didn't need to do that in that view, but it was, um, it was something that uh, we really realized there's some, some value here in visualization. You can see this um, really uh, out in the open like this. Um, another thing we, we do, we, we have been working on the State of the Union in numbers. Um, we present this every year around the State of the Union speech. Uh, we found out this year it's going to be March 1st. That I think was announced on Friday. So uh, in, a, in a couple of months, we'll be uh, presenting this as well. Um, but we go through you know, issue areas that the president historically talks about um, and really try to show the State of the Union in numbers. Um, you know, the event has really become very politicized and there's not a lot of data in it. So we try to bring a database view to it. Um, this rise heavily on data visualization is something that we're really proud of. And then finally, in terms of just getting involved in current events, I mean, we've been tracking the coronavirus crisis for the past two years now. And um, we, we have um, been uh, showing daily data, collecting it from, from states every single day since March, 2020, um, and counties at some, in some cases, depending on uh, the state. Um, and we, we put together this dashboard that um, we've had about, uh, I, we had about 20 million people come visit last year, um, entirely because we've been able to visualize all this data in one, uh, place, which is uh, something that is 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 um, difficult to do within the government, and something that um, makes you really happy uh, for what you are taking this class on, because uh, certainly data visualization is something that is just of, of huge import to um, make helping people understand data, trust data, trust facts, and getting us back on on on, on track towards a um, fact based uh, society instead of discourse. Um, so that is all I had today. Just um, really excited about um, what you all are working on. I'm happy to um, open up for questions. I know I took a little more time than I was supposed to, so <laughs> right. totally fine. There's no time to, but happy to open up. Yeah. So thank you very much. So um, yeah. So again, I kind of mentioned this at the start, but the point of this is so, sort of for Richard to give you an idea of what the organization is kind of doing overall. We have just a subset of the entire data that he's talking about. We have only really education data. Um, but there's obviously still a lot we can do with that. So with that, are, is there any questions anybody has? And I can probably just repeat it back to you if, if people have any questions. Okay, it appears not. Great. So um, yeah, I, I think we're good. Thank you so much for joining. Fantastic. Giving us that little um, overview, and we're really excited to be working with the data and having the opportunity to work with you all. So great, yeah, thank you all. Really appreciate it as well. Great, thank cool. you. Have a good class. Thanks. Looking forward to seeing what comes out, Daniel. Thanks, Caroline. Bye bye. See yeah. you, Richard. Bye. Let's go ahead and get started today. Um, so today we have too much in our agenda, as I mentioned. Um, this is kind of because like legitimately MLK Day kind of just like screwed me up in terms of uh, my plan for the term. So it's almost like I'm trying to pack two weeks into one week. So I know we're not gonna get through it all. I, as I said in Canvas, I'm going to give you at least 30 minutes for the lab. Okay, so I'm gonna lecture until like 3.20. Um, probably gonna just go straight through to get as much done as we can. And then, uh, but please do interrupt me as we're going. If you have questions, I don't want to fly through stuff that you're not feeling comfortable with. Okay. Um, so that includes you 
on Zoom as well, please just unmute and interrupt me if, um, if you need me to slow down or whatever, okay? Um, but I, ideally what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a first section of the lecture that's all gonna be on like basic data visualization stuff, okay? It's like, how do we create a plot in ggplot? Most of you should all pretty much know that, right? From the first course. But we'll talk a little bit more about distribution specifically. Like how, if you have one continuous variable, how do you visualize that data? And then we'll also look at uh, grouped data as well, which I don't uh, actually think I have in here, but we will look at group data too. So if you have one continuous variable, but then you wanna look at it by groups, like let's say, you know, gender or something like that, and maybe you have three genders or four genders, and then you wanna view like how the data looks by those different genders, right? That's grouped data. And so we'll talk about that as well. Um, Visualizing amounts is going to be, uh, it's quite related, right? Like how much of something do you have? But it's different because with a continuous variable, you're typically trying to look at a distribution, what the distributions look like if it's group data. Uh, whereas visualizing amounts, you're just really trying to compare differences, okay? Uh, so we'll look at that as well. Then that's all the first part. The second part is working with text data, okay? There's parts of this, this whole first section that is going to go pretty quick because it's just a bunch of examples, right? Um, but then this second part is a little bit more complicated than it's working with text data. So uh, we'll have one example of uh, working with text data to um, to split it into words. I say n-grams there. Um, n-grams are like bigrams or trigrams. So instead of a instead of looking at words, you'd look at two-word phrases or three-word phrases. I actually didn't end up going down that far, but if that's something you're interested in, you can read the documentation, you can check in with me. It's pretty easy to go from, instead of pulling out a word, you're pulling out two word phrases or whatever, okay? So I'll mention that when we get to that point. Um, and then we're gonna look at visualizing word frequencies, which links back to the first part on visualing amounts, okay? Visualizing amounts. And then from there, we'll talk about, okay, so this is how you work with text data, but what about string data? Like you have a column in your data set that is a string and you want to be able to do something with that. How do you, how do, you do that? So we'll look at um, substrings, uh, basic transformations and pattern matching and some of that kind of stuff. Okay. And we'll get through as much of that as we can uh, before the lab. And then when you're doing the lab, um, I mentioned in the email, but it's going to be through Git and GitHub. So I'll kind of introduce it to you before but uh, there's gonna be some string stuff on here that we might not actually get to today. You'll have the slides as a reference, but depending on how far we get, I'm also totally comfortable saying it's due two weeks from today instead of one week from today. So we can maybe make that change if we need to. Okay, so I've already mentioned that. Learning objectives for today, right? Understand various ways the same underlying data can be displayed. That's pretty straightforward. Um, think, think through pros and cons. Understand the basic structure that you need for a ggplot, basically. Um, and then take unstructured text data and be feel pretty comfortable in taking that unstructured data and putting it in a data frame, okay? So making it structured. Um, and then be able to replace patterns and strings and understand uh, characters that need to be escaped when you're trying to do that pattern matching, okay? If that doesn't make sense, that's okay. We'll get there near the end. Okay, any questions before we get started? Okay, so we'll start out with one continuous variable. The most straightforward way is to do a histogram, right? A density plot is gonna be very similar, but instead of look, binning all of the data and basically looking at the amount for each bin, it's going to assume some essentially normal distribution and it's going to bend according to the data based on whatever sort of parameters that you have there. So it's gonna, basically take the histogram and it's gonna smooth it out, okay? Um, and then empirical cumulative densities, um, distribution functions, uh, we'll look at these a little bit. Those can be nice uh, specifically when you're worried or you wanna see how well your data match um, a normal distribution. So this is like a QQ plot, which is similar, okay? So, for some empirical examples, I'm gonna move fast. If you'd like to follow along, you can, but don't feel like you need to, okay? 
So we're going to be working with the penguin beta um, from uh, the Palmer penguins packages package. So it looks like this. So I'm going to pause here for just like 30 seconds. For those of you who would like to follow along, go ahead and get R going and do, if you don't already have it, do install.packages Palmer penguins in quotes, and then uh, you should have the data like this. Okay. So I'll give you like a minute ish, 30 seconds to a minute. Ten more seconds. All right, on we go. So if we want to make a basic histogram, what we would do, right, is we're going to call ggplot. So we would first do library tidyverse or just library ggplot2. And then we're going to say ggplot, the function, that's the overall function, right? We're going to pass it the data that we want to visualize penguins and then we're going to use aes right aesthetics and what we're going to do for our aesthetics mapping is we're going to tell it the variables to access from our data plane okay so one of the things i know a lot of people struggle with early when they're using ggplot is what goes inside aes and what goes outside aes right and a really easy way to remember that is are you accessing a variable in your data set a column in your data set if the answer is yes, then it goes inside AES. If the answer is no, then it does not. Okay. So in this case, I'm saying X equals bill length millimeters. So I'm saying put bill length millimeters, the column bill length millimeters on the X axis. Then I'm going to say plus geom histogram. And we get something that looks like this. I have set the theme on mine. So it's theme minimal. So, um, you know, your theme will be slightly different, but it should look like this. You will also get this message that comes out that says step bin using bins equals 30, pick better value for bin width. Okay. But this is just what it's going to look like by default. You can make it a little prettier by using inside Geom histogram. We're going to say, okay, within the histogram layer, I want to make some modifications to the actual histogram. Okay. So I'm going to say I want the fill. So that's, you know, this, what these things are colored in with to be this color, whatever. Okay. Um, that's a hex value. I'll, I can show you in a second on that. And then the color is going to be the outline of each bar. Okay. So I want the color to be white. That's the outline. And then the fill to be this uh, hex code, which is just a blue color. Okay. And then alpha is going to be our transparency. And I generally like to so there's something up with the resolution here, because if you look up back there, I don't know why this one's not on. Um, you can see the grid lines in the background a lot better. I have a hard time seeing them up here, but the alpha is nice because you add a little bit of transparency to that fill. And then you can see the grid lines kind of behind the bars a little bit. Okay. So that's all just kind of making it prettier, but we still have this message here and it's telling us we need to do something. Okay. So we should probably listen to it. So what I'm going to do is right below that, within that same geom histogram, I'm going to say bins equals 50. Remember the default is 30. That's what it told us in that previous message. So when I switch it to 50, now you can see it looks a little more bimodal than it did before, right? So, I mean, it's, it's pretty bimodal, but you can see it's like a little more spiky, right? That's because these bins on the x-axis right here are now smaller so the amount of data in each of those bins is smaller you can look at the counts here right the the y-axis when we're using bins equals 50 the the y-axis goes to 20 when we're using oops when we're using bins equals 30 it goes all the way up to 
30. Okay, so we're getting more data in each of those bins. And when we ask for more bins, we're getting less data per bin. And so you're getting sort of more spikiness, but you're getting potentially a better feel for the overall thing. So here's an example with three different bins that we're choosing. Bins equals five is going to be really small, right? And you can count them, right? One, two, three, four, five different bins, right? This is bins equals 25, so just less than the default. And bins equals 50 that we just looked at, so 20 more than the default, okay? And so what we're doing when we're changing the bins here is we're trying to find a um, sort of sweet spot where we're able to see the overall distribution and we're not being kind of tricked by these outlier cases that are spiking all over the place or whatever. We don't want it to look super jaggedy, but we, do want, we don't want to hide anything either, right? We don't want to hide something in the data that's actually there. So when you're doing this, 30, the default, actually, in my experience, tends to work pretty well for a lot of data, but it's always good to try values maybe a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher, and kind of just get a feel for what those distributions, what the same data looks like choosing different bin widths or bins rather. Okay. If you wanted to do a density plot instead of a histogram, all you do here is instead of having geom histogram, we're going to say plus geom density. Okay. Um, again, there are grid lines there. You can't hardly see them at all up here. I have this sort of crying face because I think this is not very good looking. Okay. Um, the line is too thin and uh, it's just a line. I think it looks much better if we fill it in. Okay. Now this is not always going to be possible and it's not always going to be the case, but generally you should try to avoid line art like this, right? And whenever possible, you should fill it in. The reason for that is if you just have a single distribution like we do here, A, in this case, you can just see the thing better, right? Because when you're looking here, I mean, it could be like you're thinking, oh, is this some sort of like line that's separating this upper class from a lower class or something like that, right? Whereas here, when it's filled in, it's very clear this is the thing, all right? The other problem is when you have many things in the same plot, line art can pretty regularly introduce artifacts. So it looks like things are there that are not actually there. Now, this is like all data visualization. This is not a hard and fast rule, all right? This is a generally, it's a good idea to at least explore filling in the shape, okay? But in some cases, it's not gonna look as good. It's not gonna work as well. So you're gonna kind of always have to use your judgment. But if you're doing just a, a single one like that, then that's, that's gonna be good. Um, strange. Okay, so when you're using a density plot, they look nicer because they're smooth, right? And so it looks like this kind of nice smooth shape. However, they have significant challenges in their interpretation. Okay, so th this is the second part, and I'm gonna talk about that before I go back to the previous. Uh, the main thing is this integrates to 1.0. So the way that a density plot works is if you take the height of this thing, right, and you sum all the data from the lower part to the very top, if you sum across there, it's going to sum to 1.0, okay? It integrates to one. And so that's fine, except it makes, the y-axis almost impossible to interpret, right? What does the value of 0.06 mean? It's really hard to tell, right? What we would do if we wanted to actually interpret that and we wanted to use that is we could take the values from say 40 to 50, we would sum this y-axis value for every height all along there. And then that would give us sort of the proportion of cases that are lying in that range between 40 and 50. Okay, so there's cases when you can do that, but it's generally gonna be a lot more difficult to interpret. So be very careful when using density plots, especially if you're trying to communicate them with a general audience and not a scientific audience, okay? The other part of this is just like with the histogram, you had bins, well, now you have bin width, okay? And this is the way that that 
smoother is sort of calculated. All right. The bigger the bin width, the more it's going to approximate a normal distribution. Okay. And the smaller the bin width, the more it's going to bend to the data and be very spiky. Okay. There's different kernel shapes you can use as well. I would not worry about that at all. That might be imp important for some sorts of estimation stuff that you're doing. For visualization, I don't think the kernel is hardly ever going to matter, at least not in my experience. Okay, so the bandwidth is what's going to matter, matter the most. So here's an example where I've taken that exact same data that we looked at before. So let's go back and look at it real quick. This is what it looks like with the default bandwidth which is actually calculated based on some algorithm. I can't remember exactly, but there's an algorithm that calculates um, like an optimal bandwidth for the data given whatever, okay? And that's what the default looks like. Instead here, I'm using BW, which stands for bandwidth, and I'm saying equals five, right? So now you can see this is starting to look more like a normal distribution. Um, why does this keep jumping around? So here's an example with that same data, again, using bandwidth of 0.5, 2, 5, and 10. So 10, you can see now it, it is normal distribution like, but it's just like the whole thing. If we went like 100, this would just be like a straight line across here, right? So these bottom two are clearly not helpful at all. I'm not sure that this one's really all that helpful either, right? In this case, and in many cases, the default bandwidth actually is going to work pretty well. So um, that's not a, a guarantee. You should always probably explore other bandwidths, but the default is generally going to work okay. But you've always got that y-axis interpretation issue as well. Okay. All right. The other thing that you can do is see how well your data approximate a normal distribution. Okay, and we're going to do that with what's called a QQ plot. Okay, like quantile, quantile. So on the x-axis, you have these theoretical quantiles. So these are like basically a normal distribution, right? Um, with zero, two standard deviations below, two standard deviations above here, right? And so uh, that blue line that I have under there, that's going to represent the line that your data would follow if they followed a normal distribution exactly, okay? And in this case, we're seeing that our points are above the line up here, then they pretty much follow the line, and then they're below the line down here. So we have some evidence here that our data are not representing a normal distribution in the exact way that we would want, okay? When we're actually creating these things, instead of using X or whatever, we would say um, sample, okay? The sample data is the length millimeters. And then we're going to say stack QQ line. That's going to get us this, this line down here. And then geom QQ. And then we can change the color on each of those as I did. I mentioned colors real a second ago. I want to show you real quick. There's plenty of different ways that you can do color. And we will look at a number of them. This is one of my favorite websites, hslpicker.com. Um, what you do here, right, is you just find a color that you want, and HSL is my favorite way to think about color, because you have a hue, which is just like sort of what's the base color, and then the um, saturation, so basically how much color is in it, and then L, the lightness, right? So how much color, you pick the color, how much of that color, and then how much lightness is there, okay? And then you can kind of find a color that you like, and then down here is that hex for it. Okay, so then you just copy that and you could use that in future problems. Okay, so that's typically how I find the color channel. Any questions on any of that? Anybody on Zoom? All good? Okay, nobody's saying anything, so I think we're good. <laughs> All right, group data. So now, rather than just having a single continuous variable where we would look at histograms or density plots or whatever, we're going to look at that same thing, but by group. Okay, so now we have groups of data. So a very straightforward way, probably the most traditional way that works fine is box plots. You could also do violin plots. They're a little bit controversial because they can resemble um, anatomy, which people don't like. Um, 
and then there's jittered points as well. Okay, and jittered points are nice because they uh, actually show the data, right? But um, they can also not work so well if you have a lot of data, right? And then the the problem with jittered points, in my mind anyway, is the jittering is completely random. And actually, by default, if you're doing something like this, by default, the jittering is going to go up and down as well as left to right. And so I don't really want that. I don't want it to jitter up and down. I want it just to jitter left and right. So you can change that if you want. But I think better generally are going to be Cena plots, which are sort of, to me, a compromise between like a violin plot, which is using a, a density smoother, just like with a you know geom, geom density. But it's also showing the data just like a um, just like the jitter plot. Again, if you have a ton of data, this might not work well, but it's it's an option. Okay. There's also stacked histograms, which are not my favorite. I'll talk about those more in a minute. You could do overlapping densities, which I think very often look really nice, or ridge line densities, um, which I'll show you how to do here in a minute too. You have to use a different package for those, but those can be really nice too. One of the things that's cool about ridge line densities too is you can have like 50 groups and it will still work fine. So like, let's say you're trying to visualize the distribution of test scores for every school in a large school district and there's 27 schools, you could potentially use a ridgeline plot and it would work still, okay? Whereas with a box plot or something like that, it's gonna get really long. A ridgeline plot would get really tall, but again, if you have a medium like a web page or whatever, Tall is going to be not a problem at all. Really wide might be a problem, but really tall is not going to be a problem. You can just scroll, right? Okay, so some quick empirical examples. Um, we're going to be working with penguins data again. So to start, we want to do some box plots. We're going to say we're going to plot the penguins data. And then notice here within the AES, instead of just having the x axis, I now have a y axis as well. And so when I'm doing a box plot like this, what I'm gonna define as my x-axis is my group, whatever that group is, okay? So in this case, I'm looking at the island that the penguins were on, and then I'm looking at how their bill length varies across the different islands, okay? So that's how I specify this to start, and then I say plus geom box plot. You can change the fill if you want, and that all works, okay? Violin plots, it's going to be a very similar thing, except now I'm going to say plus geom violin instead of geom box plot. Jittered point, um, this is where we do geom jitter instead. And notice this is what I kind of referenced earlier, where I'm saying I want it to jitter left and right 0.3. Okay, so that's going to control how far out the points go. Okay. But the height I'm setting at zero. I don't want the randomness to go up and down because up and down is like my, my measurement, right? And so I don't want my measurement to be jittered. I only want it to jitter left and right where I'm, um, so that I can see all of the data, right? That's the main point here. The other thing I didn't do here, but that you very well could do is add some transparency to the points. And that will help see some of the overlapping there. One of the things I, I see very, uh, commonly with points though, is that people will add transparency to the point, but they'll leave the stroke, which is like the, the line around the point as solid. To me, that doesn't look very good. I actually end up removing that stroke. I say stroke equals zero altogether. And then you have just the point that is, has a certain degree of transparency. Okay. And then here's Geom Sina. Notice in this case, I am using a different package. I'm using ggforce. So if you don't have that package installed and you're trying to follow along, you might not be able to produce this one. So you can come back later and do that. Um, but I'm saying from the ggforce package, give me the geomcena function, right? And you've probably seen this before, but just to make sure this way of referring to a function where you have the package name and then the function is called namespacing. Okay, and namespacing is a way to access functions inside of packages without actually loading the package. Okay, if, if you have that package installed, it will work. 
and you can access just that function without loading the entire package. Stacked histogram. So now we're doing the same thing um, that we did before, except now I'm saying, okay, the bill length is on, is on the X axis, just like we had when we were looking at a single distribution. But when I do geom histogram, I'm gonna say AES bill equals island, okay? And that gives me my stacked histogram. The reason people like stacked histograms is because they are mostly interested in the overall distribution. And then you kind of want to look within that overall distribution to look at um, one specific group. This is my feeling kind of just generally about stacked histograms. I just don't understand them. I think they're really hard to interpret. You can see the blue distribution pretty well. You can see the overall distribution pretty well, but Dream and Bisco, right? The, the green and sort of uh, corally color there, like good luck figuring out what those distributions look like, right? This green one, well, both of them, they have different starting point like each time. So it's really hard to see what that distribution looks like. Does give you a good idea of the overall distribution, but um, and then how maybe one group would compare. But I just don't think they're the best choice. There are many ways around this. One of my favorite, I actually don't have in here, but I'll mention it here in a second. But one way around it is to do dodge bars instead. I still don't think that this is very good at all. Um, now it's very spiky and it's pretty hard still to see the distribution for each of those. However, at least they're all starting at the same point, right? And so we do this by saying position equals dodge. So by default, you're gonna get this, which is position equals stack, okay? So the bars are gonna be stacked on top of each other. Instead, we're gonna say position equals dodge. So instead of stacking them on top of each other, it's going to dodge them, okay? Notice this does not go inside of AES, right? Why? Why is it not going inside of AES? It's not a variable, right? It's not a column in the data set. And anything that's not a column in the data set does not go inside of AES. Much better, in my opinion, is just to do facet wrapping, okay? So you have your histogram that you would have for one of them, and then you just add facet wrap by island, okay? And then you can see all three of them. The one area where this sort of an approach is not as good as the stacked histogram is if you want to compare one group to the overall distribution, right? However, my favorite way of handling this, and I don't have slides on this because it's a little bit more complicated, um, but if you're interested in it, let me know and we can for sure do it. But is you can create a plot that looks just like this with one exception. In the background on each of these, you could have a dark gray distribution that is the overall distribution, right? And then from there, you'd be able to compare each histogram you have relative to the overall distribution. And that's really helpful because then you can see for one group, oh, this one group, the distribution looks like this. And that entire distribution is clear to the right of the overall distribution, right? And this one looks like this and it's all pretty much in the middle. This one spans the entire distribution, whatever, okay? I should find an example of that. Maybe I'll email one after class. Okay, overlapping densities is another very common example of our use case for visualizing multiple groups, okay? So here we're going to do geom density just like we did before. Everything is the same in terms of creating one density versus multiple. The only thing that's different is we're gonna say fill equals island, okay? So now, instead of getting a single density plot, I'm getting separate densities for each island and they're on top of each other by default, okay? I also, these basically don't work unless you add at least some transparency. And generally that transparency is gonna have to be relatively high. Because if you have these all as solid shapes, right, you would not be able to follow this green one 
back there at all or the red one you would have no idea what's behind this blue one blue purple one okay the default colors for this generally don't work great um that's sort of a rule of ggplot overall um i would not use the default colors for pretty much anything that you're doing there's almost always going to be better options so this is an option. I don't know if it's actually that much better. One thing that is nice about it, though, is it's all um, gradations of the same color, actually, but just varying in lightness. OK, so I say scale scale fill manual here, and we'll talk about all of this stuff later. So this is more exposure right now, like sort of pre, you know, foreshadowing what's to come later in the, the class. But I'm going to say scale fill manual, and I'm putting those three colors. And that's going to be the fill of these, right? And then I say scale color manual, which is going to be the outline of each of them. And then I'm going to say darken those three colors. Okay. And that darken function comes from a, a different package as well, the color space package. But I think that's another nice way of doing this. So I've shown you before, like with the histogram, having the outline be white. It's also nice to have the outline be a slightly darker color than whatever the fill is okay so this is 10 percent darker than these colors okay you could do more or less depending on what you like all right ridgeline density plots this is another example notice i have the color equals white here because you very regularly have these overlapping parts of these densities and so having that white there makes it so you, you can see very clearly what which is this distribution versus the other one Okay, so for this, we're going to need the GG ridges package. Okay, so you'd have to install that as well. And then from within there, you have geom density ridges, which is, is will give you this. Okay, so one thing that is, is very common that people mess up with GG ridges is almost every other thing that we're doing when we're looking at group data, let me go back to this, okay, is like this right so you have the, the categorical variable on the x-axis and the continuous variable on the y-axis that's true for this is geom Cena, but that's true for box plots that's true for jittered points that's true for violin plots it's true for most all of them right and so you might be working with something like that and then you're like well let me actually see what this looks like as a ridgeline plot but then you just try to swap out the the uh, layer so instead of having geom box plot you swap in GG ridges, geom density ridges, and that's going to fail, okay? Because the X and the Y axis are flipped for a, a ridgeline plot, okay? So you have to have your continuous variable on the X axis and your categorical variable on the Y, okay? So just be on the lookout for that because that's a very common thing where it'll come out and it'll be empty and it's like, well, what in the world is going on here, okay? But other than that, that's all you have to do to produce that. And again, this is with three groups. And personally, if I had three groups and I wanted to show densities, I'd probably just do overlapping densities as, as we did back here. Okay. I think this is probably better. However, um, if you have many groups, then a ridgeline plot is very clearly going to be preferable. Okay. All right. Questions on any of that? How's the pacing feeling? Does this feel really fast or does it feel okay? Good? Okay, great. All right. Okay, visualizing amounts. Um, so there's multiple ways that we can do this. Again, bar plots is pretty much the gold standard for visualizing amounts. Uh, bar plots are, uh, you can make them look pretty nice and they are hard to beat in terms of ease of interpretability okay you can have flipped bar charts which actually tend to tend to be my preference but that's totally personal preference okay generally it's not going to really matter if you have them vertical bars or flipped bars it's just going to depend on what you like and how you're trying to show whatever it is another sort of interesting example that's used occasionally um, is a dot plot so you use you're showing the same thing but instead of having a giant bar there, you're just putting a dot where the amount is. And what's interesting about this is with bar plots, very regularly, you'll get people that say, 
you know, if it's a vertical bar plot, the y-axis has to go to zero. It must go to zero. And what if we're talking about like GDP, right? And we've got like million or billions of dollars, right? Then like, you're gonna have to, like your bars are gonna be way up here. And then the variation is gonna be very small, right? And with dot plots, you're not gonna get that same criticism. You can start them wherever, and then you can look at that same thing. Now, uh, we'll talk about this more later in the term. There, uh, I am very much not a proponent of hard, firm rules for data visualization, right? Um, in many cases, things that people think of as like, these are the rules, they must be followed, don't work, okay? And so uh, there are good, it's good to have guidelines and it's good to have things that you're generally thinking about and whatever, but you do not always have to follow them. They're, they're guidelines, they're rules of thumbs. They're not um, like hard and fast rules, okay? So the y-axis or x-axis, depending on flipped or whatever, going to zero is a really common example of that. I think generally it is a good idea to have it go to zero. So you have a very clear reference point, but you know, for many other things, it just doesn't make sense. And it's but you can see the variation better if you start it somewhere else. Okay, heat maps are another interesting way of visualizing amounts. They're a little bit controversial because color is hard and um, a lot of people have uh, uh, disabilities related to color with uh, various forms of color blindness. And so uh, they can be very inaccessible as well. Okay, so they're a little bit controversial, but there's some things that you can do to make them more accessible. And uh, so they're not always bad. Okay, quick empirical example. I will again give you one minute to uh, copy this code if you would like. Um, I can't remember, I did not. Uh, I used to have a button on my thing to copy the code. I will try to build that in on the slides going forward. But, um, it, assuming you have the repo downloaded and everything in the data folder, there should be US average tuition Excel file. So I'll give you one minute to read that in if you would like to follow along. typically drink a lot of water while I'm lecturing and it's really difficult to drink water while I have my mask on. Masks. Is anybody else seeing that? No such file in the data folder? If you cloned the course repo, it should be there. Let's just go double check real quick. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so here's the course repo, and then inside of data, it should be, yeah, US average tuition. So if you've cloned that repo, it should be there. And if not, we can uh, work on it later okay okay uh my timer didn't go off but that's been one minute. so let's just go on. hopefully you're ready if you'd like to follow along. so this is what the data looks like so it's, this is what i would describe as like kind of a wide format we have one row for each state right and then we have columns representing the different years so let's say we're looking at what was the amount of college tuition by state in the 2015-16 school year. So this is 2015-16, that's way over here, right? So that's the most recent year of data we have in this data set, okay? And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say ggplot tuition. That's what I called the data set when I read it in, right? I'm gonna put state on the x-axis 
and then 2015-16 on the y-axis. Notice that I have 2015-16 surrounded by back ticks. Anybody know why that is? Why is 2015-16 surrounded by back ticks? because it's not a word like it's there's a dash separate those number yeah so we had somebody in person saying uh sort of similar things so uh so 2015 dash 16 could look like a subtraction problem right um but the actual and then uh yeah so merly um i think you were talking about basically that it's illegal to have a variable that's named like that. Um, and that is what the answer is. It's, you cannot start a column name in R with a number. Okay. And so in the data set, it had that column as a number, like 2015 16 is the name of the column. And so what we're doing is we're surrounding it by backticks to basically say this is an illegal um, column name. And we're just going to use it that way anyway. Okay. If you wanted to fix that, you could, you could call it Y1516 or something like that for a year. You could call it year 1516, whatever. So you could fix that and then you wouldn't have to worry about these back ticks, but that's a that's gonna happen probably pretty regularly. Okay. So, but 201516 is an actual column in our data set, right? You can see that. And when we're looking at our data set here, they have those back ticks around them. So if you're looking at your data set in your console like this and you see those back ticks around it, then that tells you you're going to need to use those back ticks when you're referring to it in ggplot or anywhere else, okay, in, in dplyr or anything, okay? So I'm putting 2015-16 on the y-axis and then I'm saying geom call. So that's basically going to say, give me a different um, column for every state and then the height of that column should be whatever the value is for 2015, 16. Okay. And we end up with something that looks like this, which um, is horrid, right? Um, this is my three puke emoji version of this plot. It's really bad. Um, you can't, I can tell that this one is Alabama and I have no idea what the rest of them are, right? Um, so two puke emoji version. We could do what, well, like, Many people's first uh, initial inclination for this is like, oh, well, let's just rotate the axis labels on those. Okay. I still think this is not good. Okay. So that's why I have it too. Puke. And that, maybe that's a little harsh, um, but it's, it's not great. Okay. Because you kind of have to crane your neck like this to kind of read everything. Um, and it's, it's a little, it's just not aesthetically pleasing to me anyway. But the way that we would do this is we would add this additional argument to the theme. Okay. How do I remember all of this stuff on the theme? You don't. Okay. Um, I've been writing ggplot code for many years. And I would say within the last maybe year and a half, two years, I've finally started to get fluent with a lot of the theming stuff. But I would still even not know what to write here to do that. Okay. Stack overflow is gonna tell you how to do this, okay? Or the, the ggplot2 docs, okay? You just search for whatever you wanna find and that will do it for you. So axis.text.x, that's gonna tell you this thing is equal to, and then the theming stuff always works like this. Like you're gonna to refer to the thing that you want and then you're gonna have a function that ends up doing all the formatting. So element text, we're gonna do something to that text and we're gonna do that within this element text function. Okay, and so we say the angle is 45, H just equals one, the horizontal adjustment, and then size equals 10. So I made it a lot smaller too, which is another reason why I think this solution is less than optimal because when it's all blown up like this, we can read it. But if we were to have this on like a page, those would be very small and pretty difficult to read. Okay, so much, much better. In fact, I probably wouldn't even call it a one piece emoji version, but I had to go linear on my scale. Um, is to just call chord flip. Okay. Or actually, even easier now with the newest version of ggplot, rather than calling chord flip, you can actually just flip them. So you could have 2015, oops, you could have 2015 16 as your x axis and state as your y axis, and then call geom call 
and it will look like this. Okay, so this is that horizontal part, right? And I said that it's going to generally not matter if you want to have vertical bars or horizontal bars. The labels are the one exception to that. If you have a lot of them, like we do here, and or if those labels are very long, then a horizontal uh, bar plot like this is going to work much better than vertical. Okay. And then a kind of smiley version, I kind of like this one. It's, it still needs a lot of work, but it's um, is we would just fact reorder state by 2015 16. So we'll talk about this more as we go on, but this should be your default. Okay. If so, that ends up looking like this. Okay. If your categorical axis does not have a uh, meaningful ordering, right? There's no meaningful way that the state should be organized. Then you should your default should be to organize it by the continuous variable, okay? Because now we have much more information in here where we can very quickly see that New Hampshire and Vermont are the most expensive and Wyoming is the least expensive, okay? And then you can kind of see the variation within there. Again, that should be your default. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be the best option. Okay. Another thing we could do to make this plot even a little bit better is we're in Oregon. So let's go ahead and highlight Oregon, right? So we call geom call here. That gets us this plot. Oops. Yeah, that gets us this plot, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and just call geom call one more time. So I'm calling geom call twice. But notice this second time I'm saying I'm adding a data argument. Okay. So I'm adding a, a geom call on top of the existing geom call. But for this one, I'm going to filter the tuition data where state equals Oregon. Okay. And then I'm just going to fill that according to whatever color you want. Cornflower blue is kind of my default uh, starting point for colors. Okay. And then we end up with something that looks like this. So again, this is like, a plot that might um, it almost looks like Kentucky though, doesn't it? It doesn't here. It looks like Oregon very clearly. Oh no, I think I just need to clear my next one. Um, okay, so you can very clearly see or where Oregon lies in the in the grand scheme of things. Okay, is this plot perfect? No, there's still quite a few things I would want to do. Um, the first being. I really can't stand this giant space here between the labels and the bars. Um, there's a really easy way to fix that, which is uh, you just on your, so this is your X axis, right? That you would say scale X continuous, and then you would say expand equals zero, zero. And that would shove this over here. Okay. And uh, I'll show you examples of that later in the term. Obviously, I don't have slides on it, so it's not something I think is super important right now. But there's other things like that that are just kind of minor to clean this up that I think would be a lot better. The y-axis is also obviously not good, so we would want to fix that too. Okay, here's an example where sorting is not good, right? Um, so in this case, the x-axis does have a meaningful order, right? It's age. Okay, so we don't want to sort by the highest value on our y axis because now it goes 50, 45 to 54, 35 to 44. Like it's kind of strange, right? This is going to be much better in terms of comparing median income by age group. Okay, because that x axis, although it's a categorical variable, it's really underlying is really actually a continuous variable that we just have the bin of data for. And so we're going to want to keep that ordering in there because it's meaningful. Okay. Let me check on the chat here. Um, the factory order function comes from four cats, which we'll talk about more in a, in a bit. And I see that Javi answered that. So thank you. Oops. And on Zoom again, please do feel free to unmute at any point. Okay, let's say now, again, this is how our data, what our data looks like. Let's say that we wanted to look at the average tuition by year. This is how our data 
look, how would we do that? What would be the first step that we would need to do if we wanted to look at the average tuition by year for every state? Actually, I don't know that I'm doing for every state to start, but let's just say by year. Exactly. We need to reshape the data. We need to reshape it so that we have a column that indicates the year and a second column that indicates the tuition amount. Okay, so we're going to do that like this. Okay, we're going to use pivot longer and we're going to say grab the columns 2004 05 to 2015 16. And notice again here, I have the back ticks on these because those are illegal names, but it's going to capture them as long as we use the back ticks. I'm going to say the names, these old names, should go to a new column called year. And the values from those columns is going to go into a new column I'm calling average tuition. Okay. And then my data set looks like this. Now I can quickly do lots of other stuff. Okay. I'm going to start by, I think, just looking by year. So what we would do is after that pivot longer, I'm going to group by year and then summarize to get the mean tuition for each year. Okay. And I'm storing all of this in an object, which I'm calling annual means. Okay. And then the annual means data set looks like this down here. And it's only 12 rows, right? Because we have 12 years of data. So we can look at it like this. That looks pretty good, right? You can see how it increases over time. One real quick point that I've been meaning to mention, I just haven't gotten to. Um, we use, I've been using geom call the whole time here, geom column, right? Um, and you have maybe used in the past geom bar instead of geom call. Okay. If you have an X axis and a Y axis, then you're going to want to use geom call. Otherwise, if you use stat bar or geom bar, you're going to have to say stat equals identity within the geom bar. Okay. And geom call doesn't do that. Geom call assumes you have an X axis and a Y value. Okay. So if you have an X and a Y, you're going to want to use geom call because it's easier than bar. Geom bar is specifically best when you're trying to say, uh, like, give me the means of this function or whatever. Okay. Because you can say, um, like, stat dot Y equals mean or whatever. Whereas by default, it does the count. So it's going to sum them. All right. So this looks okay. Um, we could flip it. So I'm using chord flip here. Again, I could just switch the order on the X and the Y as well. Is it better? I don't know. Probably not. It's about the same, right? I Again, I kind of prefer it, but that's personal preference. I think they're equally effective. Points, is that better? Maybe. I don't know. One thing that is interesting with this, right, is you can see the X axis is extending to zero here. And then when I go to points, it doesn't. It just starts at whatever the lowest value is. And so you can, you know, that might be a good thing or it might be better, might not be a good thing. I don't know what is going on with my slides here. Um, even better, I actually do think this one's better um, here because our underlying X axis is really actually a continuous variable. It's time, right? We can actually connect these points over time and look at this as a trend, right? How has the, the uh, mean price of tuition changed over time, right? What does that trend look like? And uh, so, yeah, in this case, um, notice right here, I'm gonna first change year so that it's actually being seen by ggplot as a number. So I'm using the parse number function from the radar package. That's gonna make this an actual number. And then we'll have year on the x-axis, mean tuition on the y-axis, geom line, change the color of it, and then geom point. Okay, and then again, there's some additional like styling stuff that I have under the hood that you, yours might look slightly different, um, but it's gonna basically look like this. Parse number will always parse the first number that it finds within a string. So let's say you have, um, a string that says 
in the year 2010, there were 15 kids in grade three, right? You've got three different numbers in there. Um, year 2010, 15, and then three for grade three. If you call parse number on that, it's gonna pull 2010, and it, that's all it will ever pull. It's finding the first like set of numbers, and it'll pull that one every time. If you want the other ones, you're gonna have to do more advanced stuff. But gen I use parse number all the time because generally you're only gonna have one number. If you only have one number, parse number works great. Okay, other questions? Yep. The value label, can you? Yeah, so like put the actual uh, number here, like 9,230 or whatever. Yeah, so with that, you would probably want to do geom text, um, or you could do annotate and then call text on that as well. So we're going to have a lecture where we talk about that quite a bit more, um, annotating plots. Uh, and this is also an example of an area that uh, if you're using a lot of text, then geom text or something like that is going to be the best way to do it. And or if you really want to make sure that it's reproducible, then doing it all in code is preferable. That's how I tend to work. I tend to always try to make everything in ggplot. But with that said, it can take a long time sometimes to get it right because you have to make sure it's in the same aspect ratio as what it's printing in and whatever. So there's a lot of steps in it. So that's one of the things that is very common and very legit to just say, okay, this is what the plot looks like. Now I'm going to save that as a PDF or a or a ping or whatever, and I'm going to open that up in Inkscape or some other prop program, you know, Adobe Illustrator, and I'm just going to make those annotations like that by hand. And that's that's how I'm going to finalize the plot, right? Again, that's not like my preference because it's like not reproducible, and that kind of makes my heart hurt, but. Um, but it's, it's a very legitimate way to do it. <clears throat> okay. Let's say now instead we want to show the change in tuition from 2005, six to 2015, 16. Okay. So we're looking at two years of data and we want to see what's the change in over that time. So I'm, I'm going back to my overall tuition data set and I'm just pulling three variables. I'm saying select the state, select 2506, and then 1516. So those two years I want to compare. Data set now looks like this. Now I'm going to make that longer. Okay, so I'm going to do the same pivot longer thing that I did before, where I'm now saying, what's the year and what's the tuition? So another way I could have done this is uh, done the, the pivot longer first, just like we did before, and then said filter where the year is 2005-06 or the year is 2015-16. Okay, either way, you get the same thing. So we have year and tuition. It looks like this. I'm calling this thing LT, uh, long tuition, I think is what that was for. Okay, now from here, I'm going to say, okay, put state on the x-axis and tuition on the y-axis, then put geom line but notice with my geom line i'm going to say group equals state that means i'm going to have a line for every state okay i could say color equals state too but then i'd get separate colors for every state i don't want that i want all the lines to be the same color i just want separate lines for each state so that's why i'm going to say group equals state my color i'm going to keep it consistent so that goes outside of my aes and i'm going to say gray. it's going to be gray 40 all right the gray is gray 100 is like white and then gray uh, zero is like black and so the lower the number the darker it is okay then i'm going to do geom point notice here i'm saying color equals year so i have those two years right so every state is going to have two points and they're going to be colored according to the year and then i'm saying cord flip to flip the whole thing that ends up looking like this so this is that dumbbell plot that i was talking about earlier okay and so you can see for every one of these tuition has increased. And you can see, see that very quickly because the red dot is, or a coral whatever-ish dot is always on the left side. And that more like greenish one is always on the right side. Okay. 
So again, I think these kind of plots are kind of underutilized. They're not that hard to create, and I think they're really informative. So um, I would recommend that. And in fact, I think I will ask you to create one in a lab potentially. So we could totally keep going from here. I think this is another example where um, the ordering is completely arbitrary. So I would probably order them in a way that makes more sense. There's a couple of different ways you could think about it. You could organize it based on what their starting tuition was. You could organize them based on what their ending tuition was. Or a little more interesting, I think you could organize them by the biggest or smallest change over time as well. Okay. The other thing that you can do that I think is kind of interesting is you can take this line and actually have that line be colored by the amount of change also. So if there's very little change, maybe it's uh like white almost and then as you get bigger and bigger maybe it's like super red or whatever blue green okay yep yes you could um they often if you can do it with three points where you have like two points that are connected and then one that's in the middle that kind of indicates something else However, much beyond that, it's going to be pretty complicated and uh, difficult to understand. So this is mostly for when you have group data and you want to show a change from one point to the next. Any other questions? Yeah, so then you'd use geom arrow instead of geom line. Um, and uh, the directionality I think you have to specify as well. And so you'd have to have a, a secondary uh, column in your data set that indicates whether the change was positive or negative. And then you could say that the direction is according to that variable. So it'd be a little bit complicated to fully replicate what they did, but it's possible for sure. Other questions? Yeah, actually, it might be. Um, Geom path annotate arrow, something like that. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't work with arrows all that much. Here, I'll, I'll help ggplot search. Oops, arrow. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so geom line and then arrow equals arrow. So there's a, a function called arrow. And so you, on your geom line, just like I had back here. Um, on, let me get back there. So I have geom line right here, and then you just have that additional um, arrow equals argument. Other questions? Okay, so we're going to back up just a little bit um, and uh, go to our full data set. Okay, and then I'm creating another another new long one, but now it has every state and every year. So we're doing tuition, pivot longer. I'm saying minus state. So include every column except state in that pivot longer. The names are going to go to year and the values to average tuition. Okay, and it's the average tuition for the entire state for that year, right? Okay, so now we can actually use this data to look at a heat map like this, where we have the year on the x axis and the state on the y axis. So now we're actually visualizing the entire data set, right? The whole thing. We're looking at every year for every state, and we're using a heat map to do that. Okay, there's um, other ways we can visualize this data, but there, if we're trying to visualize all of it like this, there, I, so I hesitate to say this, but I think. Everything I can think of anyway is some form of a heat map. Okay. So either a heat map or a choropleth, probably, which I'll show you in a second as well. Okay. So the way I'm going to do this is I have year on my x axis. That's a categorical variable, right? State on my y axis. That's also a categorical variable. And then I'm going to say plus geom pile. Okay. And then I'm going to, so just like a, a rectangle, right? That's what it's saying. Add it add a tile on there and then from that i'm going to say fill is equal to the average tuition so the fill of that tile 
is going to be filled according to the average tuition value. Okay, this is the default, works okay. But I think it's quite a bit better, again, if you sort. And there's no reason not to do this in my mind, right? So we'd say factory order state according to the average tuition. So now uh, what this does is there's multiple values because there's multiple years. So it's gonna take the median value and that's how it's going to arrange those factors, okay? So now we have Vermont on the top again and then New Hampshire. And so you can see down here, these are sort of the cheapest um, average tuition and then the most expensive. And you can kind of track that over time. You can see it's not fully consistent. Like some states jumped more than others. You could look at a line plot or something like that, but with 50 states, it's going to be pretty difficult to track 50 different lines and what they're all doing. I think this is even better. Uh, just changing the color scheme. There's lots of different color schemes you could choose. But again, this is an example where I don't think the default colors work all that well. They're not horrible, but they're not, we could do better, right? And this is using the Veritas palette um, with the magma option. And so you can see this yellow is just like really, really bright. And down here, this is like black basically, right? So we have like dark night and like, sunshine right and those are literally like how they come up with these palettes a lot of the times they mimic sort of colors that you see in nature and sort of how those how we associate those values okay so the, here's an example of the full sort of thing let me get this thing out of the way here i don't know Uh, Daniel, you're muted. So I've changed, sorry. So I've changed the background to be black, which um, works with the color scheme because the low value is black. So those ones start to just kind of fade away so you can't see them. And it's also going to make this um, yellow pop more because it's being contrasted with the black. So there's things you can do that like that as well when you were, were you going to say something? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so that's just another example. Okay, this is a very quick aside. I'm, we're going to uh, talk about this later in the term, but we have actual geographic data, right? So we could, if we wanted to, also visualize the data that way. So what I'm doing, there's many different ways to do this. This is a very simple way, um, just using map data. And then that comes from the maps package. Right, and that gives us a new data set. And then I just rename region to be called state. Rename, the rename function is always reversed how I would think of it. So you're saying, I wanna rename region to be state. So the column is gonna be called state and that's coming from region, all right? Then we would just join it. We end up with something that looks like this. We got the longitude and the latitude now for every state. And the group is gonna be this specific state as well, rearrange it a bit, and then we can uh, plot it like this. Okay, so I'm saying geo and polygon, longitude, latitude, group equals group, and fill equals tuition. We will mostly actually, when we're working with ggplot, we will mostly work with SF objects, simple features objects. That is not what this is. This is just a data set that has these things. Um, so this is actually not my favorite way to do mapping stuff, but it's very quick and easy. Um, and again, you could do something like this with the background being black. Um, if I had this to do over again, I would again extend this to be longer like it was before because I, I think that helps you see the color differences. But one thing that I think is interesting about this is that you can see like Wyoming is just like this black hole like all the way throughout, right? Um, so it's just been cheap from the start and stayed that way the entire time. So. Uh, I also used to have one that was like an animated GIF of this. You could do that too pretty easily, um, but I want to move on. So that's it for the basic um, text data stuff. This geographic stuff was obviously really, really fast, and that is kind of just extra stuff. Um, but I'm going to pause there for a minute. Are there questions on any of that?
on Zoom. You guys all good? Okay. All right. So then we will move on. Um, so we're going to talk about textual data. We have uh, almost an hour left, so we might get through all of this because we're going at a pretty good clip here. Okay. Um, is the pacing still feeling okay? Yes, not not too fast. Okay, good. All right, so uh, I have this disclaimer about this. Um, this is, there's so much to cover with all of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through one example of taking completely unstructured text data, making it structured, and then doing some exploratory work with it on words. Okay, that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to talk about patterns and substitutions and all of that. Okay, but um, this is not going to give you like everything you need to know if you wanted to actually do some text analysis stuff, right? This is a real quick intro to be like, hey, here's an sort of like quick how to, really quick tutorial sort of thing. And then if you want to do something like this for any other reason, you're going to have to go a lot deeper than what we're going today. Okay. And I'm happy to help you with that if that's something that you're interested in pursuing. But this is partly about giving you sort of the basic skills that you need to do this kind of work while also giving you exposure to this as a thing that you can even do. Okay. So this class, like all the classes in the sequence, it sort of has to, like, I am constantly balancing do we want to teach to mastery? So everybody is like really confident and really um, secure in all of the skills that we're teaching, or do we want to have some pieces in there that are more about exposure to just sort of show you more of the world that's out there and then uh, realize you can go and explore those things more on your own. So this is kind of in between those two extremes. There's one part of this that is full on exposure. It's not at all something that I'm trying to teach, but I just want to kind of walk you through it. Anyway. Okay. So most of you, I'm guessing, have heard these terms before, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Structured versus unstructured. All right, you'll probably hear this a lot. Structured data sets are most everything that we work with, okay? Structured data means it has rows and columns. So you can think of it like a spreadsheet or maybe like a relational database, right? Where you have multiple tables, but they all link together. and Either way, you have rows and columns, right? Unstructured data just sort of exists, okay? So for example, a photo, a digital photo is an example of unstructured data, right? It just is there. And like, how do you do anything with it, right? Text is very similar in that there is like unbelievable amounts of digital text out there, but it's all completely unstructured, right? And so you just gotta have to, figure out how you want to work with it if you want to work with it. Most text data is going to be unstructured. Um, and how you would, so like you could think about it, like if you had a digital book, right? How would you analyze the text of a book? Like you don't have rows and columns. So you have to think about something different. Okay. So the first step to working with text data is either to work with text data that's already structured or to structure it, okay? So you have to get some text data first. And I thought about it first, just getting uh, text data that was like through an R package that somebody had already structured, but that's a little bit less realistic. So instead I'm gonna take you through um, a full process where we're actually going to structure the data first, okay? There's unbelievable number of ways that you can get text data, right? The whole internet is full of text data, all right? So what we're gonna do, I think it's being super unresponsive. It's really annoying me. Um, we're going to go to Wikipedia. Okay. So anything that lives on the web is a common form of getting text data. Social media data is probably highest among them. Um, there's the R tweet package, which is super nice for getting Twitter data. And you can analyze that text data very quickly. Okay. So to do this, we're going to do what's referred to as like screen scraping. So you've probably heard of web scraping. Um, this is a specific form of web scraping that's more like screen scraping. So it's like what is on your screen on the screen when you're looking at it. 
and you're going to pull that down. Okay. So to do that, we're going to use the RVS package. And again, this is the part that is completely not like anything I'm expecting you to learn. I'm just walking you through how I did this as like more background, more exposure type of stuff. Okay. So we're using the RVS package. And the way we're going to start this is I'm going to say library RVS. And then I'm, I'm calling this Eugene. Okay. You can call it whatever you want, but this is the link to the Wikipedia page for Eugene. Okay. So I say read HTML and then I just put that link in quotes there. Okay. And then this is what the page looks like. So you can see up here, it says Eugene, and it has this kind of pronunciation thing is a city in the US state of Oregon, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So what I want to do when I say get HTML, that's getting the entire page. It's getting all of the HTML from it. Okay. What the RVS package is super nice to, and helpful with is going through all of that HTML and pulling out just the pieces that you want. Okay. So let me show you real quick here. If I go, let me actually go to um, grab this link. Oops. All right, so here it is. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. I have a uh, Chrome like browser. It's not actually Chrome, but it's very similar. You can go to view and then developer, developer tools. Okay. And then this will give you uh, the, all of this stuff here. You can click on something like this and that'll allow you to access specific pieces within it. Okay, so I can click like here, not there, there, and that will take me right to it. Okay, and then I can click here, but okay, well, what's all of this stuff? And then I see MW parser output, right? Whatever. I can find the thing that I'm looking for, then you can right click here and say copy, and then select copy uh, selector. Okay. That's going to give you, let's see what that gives me in this case. Just put it here. Yeah, that gives me that, okay? And what I'm doing here now on this next part is I'm saying, get me those elements. Notice this looks pretty darn similar to what I just grabbed with that parser, okay? And what that's doing is it's basically going through all of the HTML and finding everything that's tagged with that, okay? And then I'm passing that to HTML text too. Okay, again, I know this is quick, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's in RVEST. It's just in the latest version of RVEST. So you might have an older version of RVEST. Okay, so that should give you then all of the paragraphs and it's going to be just a vector. Okay, so this is just, this is not a data frame. It's just a vector in the same way that you know if you did c a b c d that would be a vector of four elements that had a b c d right so this is just a vector that has each where each element of the vector is a paragraph okay the first paragraph is just an empty line but then from there um also with rvs if you have the older version you could just say html text instead of html text 2 and it would probably work HTML text two is just a slightly different version. That's a little faster. Okay, so um, let's say I want to print the first paragraph. Again, that first paragraph is to totally empty. So I'm going to say uh, string wrap 50. This is just going to make the output look nicer. You don't actually have to do that. All you would probably want to do is surround it with cat because then that's going to actually make it look how it looks on the screen. And then paragraphs and give it whichever one you want. And you'll see the contents there. So again, if I go back here, we can say Eugene has the pronunciation there is a city in the US. And I see that exact same thing here, including the pronunciation even coming up correctly. Okay. So this is the fourth paragraph now. So I have paragraphs five and there it is. Okay. That makes sense. So now we have some text data. All right. And uh what we want to do now is analyze it right but 
how? Like, what are we even going to analyze, <laughs> right? Um, well, first, before we analyze it, we should probably structure it in a way that we're familiar with. Technically, once it's in a vector, it's already kind of structured. It's more structured than it is when it's on the web, right? It's actually been harvested and it's in some sort of a logical um, sequence versus just like when you're reading the HTML and you have all the HTML, that's not really structured at all. But what we're going to do, because we're almost everything we do in this class is working with data frames, right? So we're going to do that. We're going to put this text in a data frame, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a data frame where it has two columns. The first column is going to have the paragraph number, and that's just going to be a sequence from one to n, right? And then the second column is going to be the text. So we'll have the text for each of those columns in the second, or each of those paragraphs in the second column. Okay, so that looks like this. Wait a minute. Yes. Okay, so I'm saying I'm calling library tidyverse to start, and then I'm calling tibble. I much prefer tibbles to data frames, but data.frame would also work. All right. And then I'm going to say paragraph is equal to seek along. So notice I'm not doing one to the length of the thing. Uh, people do that a lot, and there's nothing that is super wrong about that. The only problem is sometimes the length of that thing is zero, and you'll get a sequence that goes one to zero, rather than if you do seek along, if the length of that is zero, you'll probably get a null, and that will uh, give you an error, which is preferable most of the time than trying to do this one to zero thing. Okay? So I have paragraph, which is going to be the number, and then description. So here's paragraph description it go it's so big it's off the screen but there is a second column there you can verify that here because it's 149 rows and two columns okay so i'm calling that the eugene df okay so can we analyze it now well not really because again what are we even going to analyze right well words that's what we want to analyze right we want to look at the words and specifically we probably want to look at word frequency so this is where the tidy text package is going to come into play. And there are other packages out there that are much more powerful for NLP type of stuff, natural language processing stuff. But the tidy text package is really nice if you're just wanting to do some quick exploratory work with it, okay? Um, but if you're wanting to do like sentiment analysis or you're wanting to do uh, like any more advanced things um, like, uh, tagging, if you're wanting to tag the words by the entity or the, um, you know, the, uh, like whether it's a noun or a verb or a pronoun or whatever, then tidy text probably won't be super helpful for that. It's like tidy text is not the most powerful package, but it's powerful for this specific part that we're going to do next, which is breaking the text into words. Okay. It's very simple to do that with tidy text. So that's why we're using it. Okay. So if you don't have tidy text, you're going to have to install that first. But then once that package is loaded, we're going to use this unnest tokens function. Okay. So just like most of the tidyverse, we're going to have our data set, which is going to be this tibble that we just created right here, Eugene DF, right? We're going to pass that to unnest tokens, and it's going to take a couple of arguments, right? The first argument is actually the data set because it's being piped to it but we're always going to be piping into it. So the first argument we're always filling is the name of the new column you want in your data. Okay. So for us, that's going to be like word. Okay. The second argument is the text data to be processed. So for us, that would be description. Okay. Description that's that contains all the paragraphs. And then the third argument is how the text should be processed. Okay, so this is that n-gram part that I talked about. If you don't supply the third argument and you just supply those first two, it's going to give you words. That's the default, is to break everything into words. However, you could uh, process it to n-grams instead and say you want bigrams or trigrams or whatever. Okay, two word phrases, three word phrases, etc. Okay, so in this case, I'm just going with the default. I'm not adding that third argument. You can look at the documentation if you want to do that, or we can, you can chat with me after class and we can go through examples of that. Um, but this is how we're going to do it generally. Okay. I have my Eugene DF data set. Notice I've loaded tidy text up here. I have my Eugene DF uh, data set. I'm going to pass that to unnest tokens. 
the new column I'm going to create in my data set is called word. Okay, word, word. I could call that whatever I want, and that would change that here. Okay, and then the text to process is description. Okay, and you can see when I look at Eugene Tidy Words, which is what I'm calling it here, I get the paragraph number, and then I get all the words there. Okay, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Okay. Um, in this case, we, it has some things like we have these three things for the description. Um, you and Gene are coming up as two separate words, and they probably really should be tied together, but they are separated by spaces, so they're kind of seen as words, right? Um, so sometimes you'll get some things like that, but it's pretty good and very easy. Okay, so what are we going to do now? Well, the first thing I would do is just count the words. Right? How often are those different words occur occurring? So I have my Eugene tidy words. I'm going to say count, count word, count the word column in my data set. And notice I'm passing this additional argument sort equals true. And here's the frequency of the most common words. Okay. So from there, I could plot the top 15 words. This is visualizing amounts, right? This is the exact same sort of stuff that we were talking about earlier, where I'm going to count and then I'm going to have word i'm going to fact reorder it according to the n and then i'm going to slice okay slice means just give me the the rows with these indices okay so i'm saying give me the first row through the 15th row after it's already been sorted by the n okay and then i have ggplot i'm going to put n on the x-axis word on the y-axis and fill with geom call cornflower blue and it looks like this so this is not very informative, right? If we look at this, it's the end of in Eugene, a two is formed like by as on the city. So we did a lot of work and we got a lot of nothing, right? Not, not particularly helpful. Why? Because they're all, all the words, all of our most common words that we're seeing are super common, right? The end of, those are the top three. And that tells us nothing, right? Those are what are referred to as stop words, okay? And this is a super common thing. You're always gonna have to deal with stop words anytime you're doing anything with text data, all right? So in tidy text though, they provide us with a dictionary of stop words. Actually, there are three dictionaries, but we can just use all of them, okay? And what we can do is that is a data set itself called stop words. And we're just going to anti-join it with our uh, current data set, okay? So you might not remember or might not have heard of anti-join. Did you guys go over semi-joins and anti-joins last class? No, okay. All right, so I'm not gonna be able to have time to fully teach you, but I'll give you a very quick primer on what these two things are. And then I'll give you resources uh, to go learn more about them if you want, okay? Specifically, it's just in the R for data science book. If you go to the joins, or maybe it's relational data, I think it's relational data chapter, um, you will find more information there. Okay, so a semi join works exactly like an inner join, right? So an inner join is like this, right? You have two data sets, and let's say these three are in common, and these two are in common, and it's like this, then these two would go together, and everything else, everything else would go away. Right. So, um, whereas like a left join would be like we have these five and we have these two in common, these would be on there, but these five would still stay. And if there's like these two down here, it would join like that and those two would go away. Right. Um, so, that's what an inner join is. It's like it's only going to keep only those rows that are common between both data sets. Okay. A semi join works exactly the same way. The only difference is a semi join um does not keep any additional columns so it's joining based on the rows but it's not actually adding any columns on for you so it's what's referred to as a filtering join it's a way to remove cases from your data set based on uh based on a second data set okay so a semi join works by keeping only rows that are in common between the two data sets so you have data set a Data set B, you join them together. Only the rows that match on both of those data sets are going to stay. Okay. 
And anti join works exactly the opposite. Okay, you have data set A, data set B, they join together. Any rows that match between those two data sets get removed. Okay, so it's the exact opposite of a semi join. A semi join keeps only the rows that match, an anti join removes only the rows that match. Okay, and so an anti join is a perfect um, way to remove stop words when we have a second data set that is the stop words okay so in the tidy text um package you have this stop words uh uh data set okay i'm setting a timer for myself so i don't go over all the time um so we have this this stop words data set it's 1149 words and it actually has three different lexicons okay so there's you could use just one of them. Um, there's smart, there's Bing, and there's something else. I can't remember. Um, you can very quickly find it out by just counting lexicons. All right. Um, I tend to not really care which lexicon. I just use all three of them. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, it, is I'm going to use anti join. So I have my Eugene tidy words here, right? I'm going to pipe that to anti join. I'm going to say anti join my data set with this stop words data set. Okay. And it's joining based on word. Okay. Word is the column on stop words. My data set, Eugene Tidy, whatever, also has a column called word. Okay. So it's, it's looking at that word column and anywhere where it finds the word a. Uh, in my data set, it's going to remove that. Okay. If I did a semi join, those would be the rows I would keep. Okay. So that's the difference between a uh, semi join and an anti join. Here, if I change this to semi join, I would get only the stop words in my data set that are there. Okay. By doing anti join, I'm removing all the stop words that are in that stop words data set. Okay, there might be other words that I should probably remove, and we'll actually see that in a second, but uh, this is going to remove a ton of very common words. Okay, so I'm gonna anti join the stop words, and then I'm gonna do my count like I did before. And if we just look at the top words, we can see it's much more informative now, right? We have Eugene City, Oregon, University, Community, Eugene's, Lane Center, Home Campus, Okay, so we're very clearly seeing some stuff about the university up here. However, I think we also have evidence, and I did not do this. So we're because I, you know, the purpose of this wasn't to be perfect, it was to just illustrate it. But Eugene is 204 times, right? And we also have Eugene and Eugene's, right? And those should probably be the same thing. And so we could take care of that with some methods called stemming or there's other, other things we could do, but stemming would be basically removing the last couple of letters. So we would get, maybe it would be Eugene like to there. And then we, this would be the same thing, right? And so those would be collapsed. Um, or there's just, there's a bunch of other ways that we could handle that, but that's problematic, right? And so I would probably add my own custom stop words to this. And I would probably remove words like Eugene when I'm, uh, analyzing text data where the entire thing is about Eugene. So obviously Eugene is going to be in there a lot. Okay. But now when I plot those top 15 words, it's much more informative. We have um, university, community, Lane Home Center, Willamette College, campus, police, church, neighborhood. Okay. So we're getting a lot more information out of it and you can get some quick themes. Very quick. Um, if we go back to the here, let me go back there a little bit. Um, you can see this is like the intro paragraph, right? But then we have all of these headers too, like indigenous presence, settlement and impact, educational institutions. One thing we might want to do is actually analyze all the words and count the words just like we did, but actually do it by that paragraph. So we can see if there's certain themes that are coming out by the paragraph or whatever. Okay. So I did that. I added what I'm calling the header into this. The code to do this was complicated and it was not very um, clean because the HTML was not super clean and how those were uh, coming out. So 
I did it a little bit manually. So I just hid the code for it. You can go ahead and look at it on the repo if you want. It's not super pretty, but it works for this one use case. Okay. So we can see these first three paragraphs are about the intro. And then we have the history. Those next couple of paragraphs are about the history and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So now we might want to count words by the header. Okay. So um, I am going to unnest tokens word description just like i did before but now with my count instead of counting word i'm going to count header and word okay so i'm going to count instances of word within a header basically okay and sort equals true so now you can see it's organized by uh header and then word and so you can see or i guess word then header um, Eugene is the most common word for arts and culture. It's the most common word for history, and it's the most common word for infrastructure. Okay, so Eugene is pretty clearly a very common word in a article about Eugene. So it's probably something we should remove. But I, again, I didn't um, for this small case. Okay, now we probably want to plot it just like we did before, and we also probably want to have it uh sorted just like we did before however because we have these headers we want to actually facet wrap so we're getting a different plot for each header right but this ends up being complicated because what we need is we want them ordered within each facet okay so you can't do that standard uh forecast fact reorder function to reorder one of them because it needs to be reordered within each of those facets, okay? And so that ends up being a little bit more complicated. Again, this is kind of a little bit um, out there, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this reorder within function in uh, tidy text. So I'm gonna say reorder word according to in within each header, okay? And that's all I have to do. And then the rest is the same, except I also add one more thing scale y reordered okay and then i get a plot that looks like this okay so what i was what well, all of that scale within stuff is is making sure that these are ordered like this within each of these facets okay so it's not according to the overall n it's according to the n within each facet that it's ordered by okay so again this is a little bit um it was certainly fast and it's a little bit uh like you know toy example but this is a very common thing that you often do with text analysis is looking at word frequencies or ngram frequencies within specific categories so you know for example if you're analyzing let's say all of the newspapers from 1920 to 2020 and the text that's in those newspapers you might want to group it by newspaper or you might want to group it by year or whatever okay Okay, so deep breaths. <laughs> I'm gonna lecture for probably about 15 more minutes and then we'll go to the lab, okay? Um, but I'm gonna pause here for just a second. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of that is about exposure, but I'm hoping that um, you, the actual basics of being able to take at least, not the structuring part, but if you have structured text data, you should be able to move it to a tidy text data frame where you have each row represents a word okay you could do n-grams too but i'm going to expect words at least okay and then uh be able to produce those plots of word frequencies okay the rest is kind of a little bit more beyond but that basics is what i'm i'm looking for and that will actually be in your lab okay any questions All right, here we go. String manipulations. We're probably not going to get through all of this, but we'll get through what we can. Why is it not working? Um, so whenever I talk about string manipulations, I have to clarify. There's tidy verse version of doing this, and then there's the base version of doing this. And I I really like our studio. I really like the tidy verse. I like the work that they do. And so there's part of me that's always kind of like, well, I'm just going to kind of stick with what they're doing. However, string manipulation stuff is just one where I just can't ever break my 
pre-tidyverse habits. Okay, so I I work with base R for string manipulations, and partly it's because I just don't think that the stringer stuff gives me much that base gives me already. There's occasional examples where some there's some function in stringer that works really well that I'll use. But for the most part, um, the functions in Stringer are going to be the exact same as the ones in Base, with two exceptions. One, their names might be a little bit more, a little easier to remember. So you might not remember the word grep, grep, or greple, but you might remember string detect. Right? That's easier to remember. So that's one advantage of using Stringer. And then the other one is consistency. So in Base R, it's very inconsistent. Sometimes you put the a vector of strings that you want to search through first and then pattern second for other functions you put the pattern first and the string sort through second okay so that's super annoying um stringer is not that way it's very consistent every function is the string first the pattern second okay so stringer is better for those reasons for consistency and for ease of remembering stuff if you end up doing a lot of text stuff stringer has other um advantages too but those are the main ones, okay? Uh, so when we go through this, I'm gonna take you through at least this example, and then we can uh, see how much time we have left from there. But uh, I'm gonna walk you through the base version first, and then I'll show you the uh, stringer version as well, okay? So this is a very, very common example. Here I'm creating a new data set that I'm calling X for example, right? Where I have this gender column and we have a bunch of different genders and they're all completely inconsistent in terms of how they're coded okay this happens mostly when you have data that's being collected that is free response okay so gender is a very common one that you have a free response thing on right and so you might get some people that are just putting f other people that are putting f but it's uppercase other people that are putting fem i don't know why you'd put that but you know whatever it's an example um female female all uppercase Right, and then different versions of non-binary, of agender, gender fluid, and then no response. Okay, so those are, and then no response one. Notice I only have one there because I'm assuming that there's something on the back end that's saying, okay, if this is missing, we're just going to fill it in with no response. So that's like an automated one, but all the rest of them are free response, and we have to figure out some way to deal with this. Okay, so this on the left is what we have, like all of these different counts of different genders and what we want is what we have on the right which is just one one row for a gender right and one for female and one for fluid and one for male and and we don't want like you know three different ways of having a gender okay so how do we deal with this i'm going to walk you through it okay um and it does take a few steps and this is also i'm walking you through what i think is the simplest way to do this but there are many many different ways to do this um some are much more complicated but have much smaller code um you know less code but maybe not the most readable i think this way that i'm going to show you is logical and readable and hopefully will make sense but it's maybe not the most brief way to do it okay the first thing i always do when we're looking at something like this is look at inconsistencies in case right so we have uppercase letters and we have lowercase letters and that's a big problem with with what we have going on here right all throughout here we have male and we have male right and so we want to we want to make those consistent that's the first step that we're going to do so there the options are in base we have two lower or two upper okay and then with stringer, we have string to upper or string to lower. One of the other things that is consistent about stringer is every function starts with this str, which I'm going to pronounce string, even though it's more like str, right? But that's what it stands for is string. So string to upper, string to lower, and then, or you have base to upper and base to lower. Okay. So again, my preference is generally to use the base functions. So we have x we're going to count gender this is what we had originally our modified version just by saying gender to lower gender right that takes care of a gender all together right it fixes all of those it also fixes 
some of the female, right? It fixes, the, it collapses those ones and it collapses these ones. It also collapses both of these. Okay, so we only have one M now. So just that one step has fixed a lot of problems for us. Hasn't fixed everything, but it's fixed a lot of problems for us. Okay, so what's next? One thing we could do is we can see that this is fluid, this is gender fluid. So we could collapse those as well, right? So how are we going to do that? This is there again, you could use stringer string detect, string underscore detect, or what I typically use is called grep full. Okay, so there's grep and there's grep full. Okay. GREP stands for Global Regular Expression Parser. You don't have to remember that at all. You just have to remember GREP means search through a string, okay? And then the GREP will always return an index, like one to n, and then grep bol will return a logical, so true, false, okay? So I'm gonna use grep bol within an if else to search for a pattern, and it's going to return true if it finds that pattern, and it's gonna return false if it doesn't find that pattern, okay? So uh, in Stringer, it's string detect. And you can see, this is exactly what I was talking about. They are essentially the same function, except you flip the order, okay? Other than that, they're identical in terms of output, string detect versus grepl. Okay, so starting out with grepl, I have mutate, I'd say gender equals two lower gender. And now I'm redefining gender again immediately and I'm saying if else, greppel fluid in gender. So I'm looking for the term fluid in gender. If it finds it, if that's true, okay? If this greppel returns true, then I want it to be gender fluid. Otherwise, just make it whatever the gender was before. Okay, so that this if else is, this is the condition, this is the logical, true, false. This is what we're gonna do if it's true. This is what we're gonna do if it's false. Okay, and so down here, you can see now we have just one gender fluid, it's 56. We could go back and check um, the numbers if we wanted to, to make sure that's right. It is right though, so we'll just move on. Okay, here's the stringer version. Notice it's exactly the same, except I have string detect gender fluid instead of fluid gender with grepl. Okay, I don't care if you use base or stringer, it's up to you. Um, I just uh, wanna show you both because you will absolutely see both out there. I think Stringer is probably on the lower side of adoption for the tidyverse packages relative to others like dplyr or tibble or whatever. Okay, so what's next? We're still not totally done. This is where we're at at this point. Any ideas on something we could do next? Yep. Yep, so we have F, fem, and female. So how would, how could we collapse those though? Any ideas? Starting with an F, exactly, yes. Because if we look through here, the only ones that start with an F are F, fem, and female, right? None of the rest of them start with an F. So what we can do, I'm doing it with male to start, um, but it's the exact same way. Only those that have an M, start with an M, are male. So let's go back there just to double check. We've got M and male, right? Only the two of them, whereas female has the three of them. But it's the same way. There's nothing else that starts with an M except those two, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use this little caret within our search pattern, which means starts with, okay? And so it's going to end up looking like this. These first two lines are the same. And now for gender, we're going to say on this third line, we're going to say if s, if else, grepl m. Notice I have caret m because I'm saying starts with m, then it's going to be gender. Otherwise, or if, if it starts with m in the gender uh, column, then it's going to be male. Otherwise, it's going to be gender. So if it if it starts with M, this is the condition that is going to happen if it's true, and this is what's going to happen if it's false. Okay. And when we look down here, we now have one 
male. So that's good. We can replicate the same thing again for females. However, I want to point out that we can do this for female now because we've already handled the gender fluid one. Okay. Because remember, before for fluid, we for gender fluid, we had gender fluid and we had fluid, right? And those were two different um, ways of of uh, you know communicating the same thing. But one of them was fluid, and we couldn't say starts with F if we hadn't taken care of that already because it starts with F, right? But because we already have, we changed it to gender fluid, so now we can. Okay. So I say you try first, but um, we're going to just go on. Okay, so this is just the exact same. And now we've taken care of all of them except the non-binary ones. Okay, so here I would like to just say starts with N, but I can't, right? Anybody see why? No response. Exactly. So I can't say starts with N. I can't even say starts with N-O because non-binary, right? So I've got to figure out some other way to do this. Again, there's many ways to do this, but one way I would do this is to just use Boolean logic. So it would be like this. I'm going to say if it starts with N and it's not no response. So if gender is not equal to no response and it starts with N, then we can call it non-binary. Otherwise it's gonna be gender, okay? And then when we say count, now we're finally at the place we want to be, okay? So um, my timer's about to go off, but I do have four more minutes based on what I said at the start of class. So let's see what we got here. So here's the stringer version, same exact thing, except I'm changing all of the grepples to string detect. Okay. All right. Um, special characters. This will probably be the last thing I talk about today. Um, yeah. So there are many special characters. We've already seen one of them, which is the carrot. Okay. The carrot and the dollar sign are what are, what are referred to as anchors okay so it's saying starts with for the carrot or ends with with the dollar sign okay there's also all sorts of other ones and these all go into um what are called regular expressions okay regular expressions are super powerful and a really great way for doing really complex pattern matching um however they are also super complicated and take a long time to learn okay i use regular expressions all the time now but it it was years before i used them at all you can do tons of string manipulation without doing any or at least very minimal um regular expression okay i would say the starts with which we already saw the dollar sign for ends with and the pipe which means or look for this or that right those three things are going to get you a long way towards um, everything we just looked at. But there's also things like you can look for a digit, you can look for only alphanumeric um, things, all sorts of different stuff that you can do. However, the main reason I'm showing you this is because there's also, so there's the, the period, right? It's just a wild card one, matches any character. The reason that these are really important to pay, pay attention to is because you're going to have to escape these okay so if you're say you're looking through uh um i don't know you want to replace all the periods in a in something like so for example a, a fairly common one is you have a bunch of column names and it's like uh t dot one t dot two t dot three for time one time two dot time three and you just want to remove that dot. So it's just T1, T2, T3. Okay. You can't say um, search for the dot. It won't work because it's going to search for any character. So instead, you have to escape that. Okay. And to do escape that, let me see if I have an example here real quick. Why is this being so slow? 
Um, to escape that, I'll just come. So here's an example of the here's an example of the or, right? And county, whatever. To escape it, it's gonna be like this. You're gonna put two slashes. And the reason you have to do two slashes is because one slash is already actually a special character. So you're you have to escape it first. Okay. And so it ends up like this. So in this case, I'm replacing all the dots in a URL with dot. Okay. So I have to escape the dot like that. Okay. And this is using a function called G sub, which um, I'm not going to really talk about today because we're basically out of time, but I'll show you later. Okay. But just real quick, let me open our studio and I'll show you an example of exactly what I was talking about. So let's see maybe Hello. um okay so i'm just gonna create like a like this uh, daniel we can only see the oh. dvd yep i got you yeah thank you okay so you can see now right yeah yeah okay great so let's say i have a vector here that's like this and it's uh t.1 t.2 T point three, right? Let's just keep it like that. Okay. If I want to replace all of those points with, like, if I just want to remove all of those points, I could use G sub. I'm going to notice it's saying pattern replacement X. Okay. So that's that's the order. Um, I think in stringer, it's string underscore replace, or the G sub equivalent is actually string underscore replace all. Okay. Underscore all. So the pattern is going to be. I could say, okay, look for a dot and replace it with nothing in V. Okay, that is not going to work. It's going to return nothing all the way across because that dot is what it's looking for. There is one way around this, which is we could add an additional argument here where we would say fixed equals true, and then that's going to work. All right, but better is to just escape that dot like that, and then it works fine. Okay, so if you're running into unexpected things with your string manipulations, check to see if you're looking for a special character on accident, and then make sure to escape that special character. Okay. All right, any questions before I introduce the lab real quick? All right. So let me get over there. Uh, and let me switch my share. Okay, so here we are at the course website, right? And if you go to assignments, you will see collaborative git slash github, basic plots, and working with string and text data. Okay, that, it, that should link to the lab, which is here. The other way you can get to this is if you're anywhere on the, the website, you can also click tags, okay, and then labs, and here's the lab one. So we'll have more labs, right, but lab one, okay? So you can look through this lab, but basically it's going to, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of different things. Okay. I want you to work in groups. Ideally, they would be the same groups that you're going to work with for your final project. So you can get used to working with each other. And then you're going to create a shared GitHub repo. Okay. So you could, any of you could own the repo, but you need to grant access to the other people on your group. Okay. Then, you're going to create an R markdown document and you're going to work on different pieces of the lab together. So each of you are going to kind of choose different pieces to work on. You should file issues in your GitHub repo saying what needs to be done. Okay. So when I go and inspect this later, I should see issues that have been closed. And then you're going to create branches for those issues. So you're going to have an issue that is like, like, for example, right here, you're going to create this plot. And then down here, you're going to stylize the plot. Okay. Um, you're going to style the plot. So you don't have, uh, so you could have one issue for creating the plot and a second issue for styling the plot. Okay. And then what you could do is after the person whose role it is, is to create the plot, they're finished. They have a branch for that. They're going to push that branch up. Then they're going to create a PR. And then you should have everybody in your group review that PR before it gets merged in. Okay. But then you can tag the person who's going to do the next part of the lab. 
right there and they should know how to help you from there okay so you're going to create branches for those issues different people work on different branches and then you merge them in when you're ready submit a link to the repo through canvas so what you're actually going to submit to me is not in our markdown document but just a link to your shared github repo okay i'm going to inspect it i'm going to look at the issues that have been uh created and closed the branches that have been created and merged and deleted probably and then i'll give you all credit from there okay so to receive full credit for the lab you must create and merge branches okay um i would like you to file issues and everything like i'm saying here too i think that's very helpful and it's good practice but you have to create and merge branches okay i really want you all to get practice with working with branching because it's an important topic Okay, and I don't think you did it much at all in the first course. Is that correct? Okay. So if you need help with that, review those resources I, I shared earlier. If you're still struggling with it, um, get in contact with me and we'll figure out a time to Zoom so I can work it, uh, walk you through it a bit more. Okay. And I could meet with your whole group or I could meet with just you. It's fine. Either way is fine. Okay. We're going to work with Tidy Tuesday data from um, 2019. Um, this is specifically data on the rstats hashtag from uh, Twitter. So it has like 500,000 tweets in it, okay? So the data is in the data folder in the course repo already. So you should have it already. And then these are the steps. So first create a shared repo, um, and then you're gonna do some initial explorations of the uh, display text width uh, column in there. And then final versions of each of the two plots and at least two branches, each of which have been merged in. Those are sort of the aspects I'm looking for in the lab. So for the initial exploration, you're going to create histograms and density plots of the dis display text width. So this is a way to get you experience with looking at different bin widths and different bins and different options like that. Okay. So try at least four different bidding methods and then provide a brief justification in text for which one you think is best for both the bin width for the density plot and the bins for the histogram, okay? The next thing you're gonna do is you're going to look for the word plot in the text column, okay? So when you pull that data in, you'll see that there's a column called text, which is just the post, the text from the post. And you're gonna look through all of those posts to find, to see which posts contain the word plot. Okay, then I want you to report to me in the in the lab the proportion of posts containing the word plot. Okay. Then you're going to, going to create this plot. This is a plot of the 15 most common words represented in the posts. And I have some guidance down here for how you're going to replicate that. So specifically, you're going to want to join it with the stop words we had before, but you're also going to want to filter out these additional words okay so what you're going to want to do is say if the word is not in here okay if this can be a little bit tricky the not in doesn't always work how you might expect so i've got a stack overflow post here you can go look at if you want okay then finally you're going to style the plot to look sort of like this it doesn't have to look exactly like this you don't have to have everything exactly right but it should be roughly like this okay so i want the title correct i want the caption correct those sorts of things if you get your color a little different or you don't have the grid lines the same that's fine okay i'm mostly looking for words and captions and those sorts of things okay um so finishing up so this is just the last thing it's expected this lab is going to take you more than the now 20 ish minutes we have left of class uh so you'll have to work on this outside of class as well but right now is the time to get started and for me to answer any preliminary questions you have for the next 20 minutes okay any questions before we get started <laughs>